Hey, Marshall Sager here. Welcome back to the discussion version of the realignment. Hope you guys are having a good week. We're doing this on Friday. It's kind of an experiment. Maybe this is actually the day which these should come out, but a lot of great things to talk about. Real quick, I'll do a quick uh, off the top of my head read for a supercast. It's why we're expanding to three episodes a week. It's because folks are giving us $50 a year, $5 a month, or $500 for a lifetime membership. Just got one of those in on the Stripe page. Really appreciate that. Like Once again, we're starting the exclusive content next week, but everyone who's supported so far has done it because they want to help us actually make this show bigger and better. So we appreciate it more than anything. Sagar, anything quick thing you need to add before we get into things? No, I mean, look, it's, uh, yeah, exclusive stuff. Look, guys, we just need your help. We need your support. Like, do you want it to go or not? It seems like the discussion episodes are doing really well. Uh, they actually do cost money. Marshall has to go and book the guests. We have people who do a YouTube thumbnails and all that stuff. And the show is growing. It's doing well. So for those of you who have invested in the show, thank you. Um, and if you can continue to support us, it, it really means a lot. You know, have, running these businesses is not a joke. And I know it seems all fun games, uh, all that stuff. I actually do think that people don't do enough work to explain just how the sheer expense that it costs in order to make these things run. The vast majority of them are subsidized or uh, a lot of people who do only ads and all those other things, they have their costs covered, but that's just not really what we do here first. And so I'm glad that we're doing this. It's important. Yeah. And the thing that I'll add in soccer, we talked about this, but look, like we exceeded what I thought we'd bring in last month. And that's just kind of inspired me to be like, okay, look, let's like treat this seriously. Look, let's take yeah. this actually to the next level. So like my goal this year by April is be doing this just totally full time. So like no more Marshall stacking up like 15 different like nonprofit salaries, yeah. just actually go all in on it. So if you want to help us actually do that and help Sagar actually make some money from this eventually, hmm. uh, would love for you to go to realignment.supercast.com or go to the link into the show notes. So a lot to talk about, but I want to start, um, Sagar, something that's directly related to Supercast. You said the anniversary of Supercast. And we were talking a lot about the anniversary of you launching Breaking Points. Um, we'd love to hear just a quick reflection on you because what was interesting to me about Breaking Points is just the fact that it was kind of, you're not just launching a media company, you kind of had a theory here, right? Yeah. Which is that the way that news is doing, it's broken, we could do something better, not just like make money. I think people are already proven that. So just would love you to reflect on that for a second. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, in the context of the Supercast pitch, I had no idea. I mean, you you remember we were nobody knew how this thing was going to do. No one. Uh, it exceeded our wildest expectations literally on day one, and that was crazy. And that really just put it well. And honestly, it was almost a burden because we still had to get the show off the ground. Like I don't think people realize how difficult it was in order to iron out the kinks. I mean, for those who are breaking points, <laughs> subscribers, as people can see right now, just dealing with email systems alone consumes hours of my time in order to try and make sure that our new email system goes uh, correctly, customer service, uh, how are making sure everything is working or payroll. And now we've got, you know, partners, Marshall, like you and others, that stuff, it takes a lot of work. And so I, I don't know if I knew that that was going to happen. I don't think I ever conceived that that would end up this way. I'm fine with it. I'm glad it is. I'm really glad that the business is kind of humming as we kind of head into a economic recession. I have no idea how things are going to go. I've mentally prepared myself for the fact that growth uh, may not just you know stop. It could either flatline or even reverse slightly. And I mean, look, I'm going to blame people for not signing up for freaking breaking points premium or realignment premium when gas is $5 a gallon. No, man, like live your life. Go buy food. Like I, I'm never going to hold that against you. I absolutely get it. I understand consumer spending and sentiment and all of that. So this, you know, it's it's been difficult. And look, I mean, the theory of the case. I don't know. I feel like I've gotten a lot of the triumphalism out of my system. Like it's cool. It, it's really cool. I want to make sure that now it keeps going. So I've gotten past the like. I can't believe it's top ten podcast. I can't believe it's always top ten now. It, it just is what it is. That's great. Uh, it's awesome. Now it's make this thing sustainable. You know, CNN and New York Times and all those other people, what make them great businesses, and I, I know, you know, as much as I dunk on them, what makes them great businesses is their ability to survive the downtimes. I personally think that's where we're headed. And that's not a reflection on our content. We can't do anything about it. The content, frankly, is doing way better than ever. It breaks records all the time. Routinely, honestly, even better 
than what we used to do at Rising with half the amount of clips and half the or one third the amount of staff. So I'm super proud of that. We're reaching more people today than ever before. But that's just not really how money works in the content game. Yeah, no, and that's the <laughs> what I think is funny is we talked about this right when you launched. The version you just gave was much sexier back then. Yeah. Now it's like you did it. And now the question is, can you just can we basically keep chugging along at these things for a while? So that's just a that's a key thing. I want to get to our next thing, which is a a story, which I've noticed you guys haven't really covered that much on breaking points. And it's a huge story. It's the the January 6th committee. So oh, we covered I want to ask you to be fair, you covered, did, but that's uh, the thing you, did, you did what 45 I 45 minutes. You did, I, you, you did, you did, you did, you know, you did, you did one segment. So I'm going to ask you this question on, on, on two levels, like a, like, what is it? I'll give you my take. What is your take on the January 6th committee? And then two, why do you think the committee, regardless of how someone feels about it, right? Like there are plenty of Republicans who did not like the Watergate hearings. Mm. It didn't matter because they are significant. Why is it not captured the political imagination of the moment. So your opinion, and then why has it as a political project not succeeded? Well, number one, I just think it's cringe um, because I don't think anybody actually, here's the thing, the basic facts of January 6th were known on January 7th. Uh, and then whatever else we needed to know was known by January 12th or whatever. Uh, yeah, Trump denied the election. Then he gave a speech and he said, we're marching down to the Capitol or something, whatever, Trumpers, don't come after me with the exact language. I don't give a shit. He said, in spirit, we're going to the Capitol. And then people did. And then people broke in and they desecrated the Capitol. And it was a disgrace on the Capitol Police, on law enforcement and on the sitting president of the United States. And then some senators who shall remain nameless decided to object uh, to the electors anyway and beclown themselves in the eyes of history. Case closed. I mean, I, I don't know what else there is to investigate, to be honest. That's part of been my problem from the beginning. Uh, so from a sheer like hearings perspective, the facts of Watergate were crazy and legitimately did need to be investigated. I mean, there was, first of all, there were secret recordings and then there was the underlying crime and then there was a legitimate cover up. Here's the thing about Peter Navarro and John Eastman and Trump. They were all far too stupid to actually cover this up in any meaningful way. And again, the broad contours and the facts were immediately knowable to the entire U.S. population. Now, in terms of their implication, why have they not caught fire? Guess what? Gas is $5 a fucking gallon. It's June 9th. It's been 16 some odd months since January 6th. If we want a relative accounting about that's oh here's the other thing about the hearings and what pissed me off they're not fulsome actually in the way that watergate was watergate was legitimately a fulsome investigation that was bipartisan in nature maybe this could be a uh, commentary in the modern gop i don't know if watergate would happen today it probably wouldn't uh but the hearings and the investigation by jan six nobody's talking about the capitol police Nobody's talking even about the uh, FBI or potential like police informants and others that could have shown or had some insight into why this is happening. It's purely ideological and partisan. We talked about this previously, Marshall. I don't want to preempt you, but the fact that Jamie Raskin says that one of the recommendations of the committee is to abolish the Electoral College, I'm just like, okay, like, it's not about January 6th. So that's my take. Well, well okay, this is interesting okay. because- Jamie Raskin. So Jamie Raskin is a, is a member of Congress and also has a background as like a serious like constitutional yeah. scholar. The interesting thing, and this is so Jamie Raskin's in a bit of a spat with Liz with Liz Cheney about this because I'll play Jamie Raskin for a second. Sagar abolishing the electoral college is exactly about making sure January sixth never happens ever again because mm. without an electoral college, there wouldn't be electors there wouldn't be this certification process. There would simply be a popular vote, which you couldn't manipulate. Sagar, you know, as you know, this is a true fact. There are all sorts of crazy Republicans who are getting elected all across state houses in this country, and they are all pledging to basically not let January 6th happen yeah. again, but from the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. They are going to basically say, like, we are going to act in bad faith in order to give Donald Trump the presidency in, 20, in 2024. So... With that in mind, if we could just abolish the uh, electoral college and have a popular vote, that would solve the issue. Now, and this is where I'm no longer playing 
um, him. My beef with that whole argument, and this is Liz Cheney's argument, is that is just not on the table, and that is just yeah, a waste of all of her time. Now. Go ahead. Her, yeah, well, try yeah, her because her, her her point is because once again, Liz Cheney is incredibly partisan now. Um, I think in ways that I think are a a sign of her integrity and also in ways that are just like gratuitous. But her whole argument is no, like the second this becomes about the abolishing the electoral college, there's nothing that I can do with that. So there's this huge fight there. So I, so I think that's just yeah. my one pushback on it. I, I think Jimmy Rask, like, it's kind of funny. Like if your whole critique is that these January 6th hearings wouldn't actually address the underlying bit here or actually result in anything, if you could just snap your finger and abolish the electoral college and have a national popular vote, that actually okay. kind of would address some of the things they've identified, which is, so here's, let me ask you a question then. Actually, just respond and we'll go back. Well, I was going to say, then fine. Uh, my uh, response is then win elections. If you don't want D Doug Mastriano, who is some crazy fuck, to win the Pennsylvania uh, gubernatorial election, then beat him. If you don't want, uh, if you want to change the, fine, okay, run on that and win the electoral college. And you be my guest. You can try and change it. Nobody's stopping congressional de or, uh, state Democrats from doing what these crazy ass GOP false electors people are doing. You create a plan in your state legislature. You win. Enact it. Be my fucking guest. I mean, this is uh, this is again to the Liz Cheney's point. Like you exist within a system. You could bitch about the system. Fine. Uh, if you want to change the system outside of violent revolution, then you're going to have to act within the confines of our existing electoral structure. And frankly, like that's that, that's the other thing that makes me so annoyed about with all this cope. Guess what, guys? It's popular vote for the Pennsylvania gubernatorial race. If you get your ass beat by Doug Mastriano, that's on you. I, I don't really know what else to say. If you lose to a guy who's at that crazy. Or Michigan GOP, where I think the guy, leading guy, was just elected. I believe every single person in the Arizona Senate GOP has also endorsed the idea that the election is stolen. All right, well, you know, it's on you if you can't beat that person and make a legitimate uh, Democratic small D case. You know, I'll bring up, uh, you know, David Brooks actually had a good column on this that was actually just surprising, but also obvious when you think through his thought processes. So his point was it's David Brooks, right? So David Brooks is basically like a center left Democrat now. Like obviously he's going to yeah. be um, a person who's very like, we need to prevent Trump from coming back again. But his beef with the January 6th committee is the point that no one is going to have their mind changed or have any value added by discovering more facts about that day. So like, look, it's true. There are bad, there are terrible, terrible, terrible texts that were sent by people in the White House um, on that day. Um, Jerry Kushner and Ivanka, they're gonna, their testimony is gonna be played for folks. All sorts of like genuinely, like honestly, I think should be career ending things are gonna be out. But his point is that's not what the issue is moving forward. Yeah. His beef with the committee is the committee's not focused as deeply on what happens in 2024. So a legitimate, and, and look, and this, and this is kind of the point, like you kind of hinted at this when you said like, this says something about the state of the GOP, like let's get real for a second. Like the GOP was never going to cooperate in any version of this essentially. This is like the, this is the political mm -hmm. incentive issue. That said, it would be much easier to turn that into a political issue or to take it somewhere productive if your point is, this isn't about getting us to all like hashtag out our individual specific opinions of Donald Trump, yay or nay. This is about what happens on January 6th, 2025. So if this doesn't happen ever, ever, ever again, and every single thing in these hearings are not going to be dedicated to, and, and actually I, I can't even say, oh, you can't talk about like bad text messages that are sent because that's no, talk, unfair like, in the other you direction. You can talk about whatever you want. If they were, yeah. if they, if they are going to relate to something forward facing that we could actually do, right? So if it's discovered that, oh, like there was this vulnerability in the actual system, but if the conclusion is basically, I don't want to even say cope because to Jimmy Raskin's point, the popular vote would have, would solve, I'm putting this in quotation marks, a lot of these issues, but that's like a deus ex machina, right? That's like this magical solution that requires like the snap of the finger. No, like what are the straightforward things that actually need to be done there? So I think that was a really, I think that was a valid critique by just say uh, something, David Brooks. Uh, yeah. Can I get to say something to, again, to respond to this? This again presumes that there is a technocratic fix. There isn't. There's one fix, win the election. 
that's it. Like, well, that's not, that's not, I mean, that's not true. Well, what technocratic fix could they, could they change? They'd have to literally change the electoral college act. I think of 19 or 18, whatever, which that's not going to happen. But, huh? I mean, but, but the thing is like, well, this win is, the this, election. Okay, this, there's only one way to fix it. Win the election. Like this is, look, I'll do more speaking up for like the Democrats here. Um, the obvious point is. They would say, yes, Sagar, we agree we need to win elections, but without processes like this committee, without like serious work on the policy side, they would not know actually know what to do when they win that election without the work that they're doing here. And I think to your point, though, of why this has failed as a political project, for most people, this committee does not read as, hey, we're going to come up with the 10 things that one would need to do. To prevent this from happening ever again. Like that is probably not the public perception. The public I perception mean, is, okay, we're doing this so that we could, I think rightfully, haul bad actors in front of the cameras and make them feel bad and sure. like hurt their careers. I, I think that's the public perception when I think actually I would like to know what the specific things, like what are the vulnerabilities? And guess what? Like to your point, yes, it's true that we probably – Actually, I'm not sure though. So you're saying we couldn't pass it? You know, well, the like electoral college act? No, I already know. They proposed it. It's not going to pass. So like there there was a bill to, I, here's how I understand it. Like taking away the ability for, here's the thing though. It doesn't even matter. I mean, Holly objected to the uh, results and it didn't change anything. And as I understand it, even if Pence had done the stupid ass thing that Trump had wanted him to do, it also wouldn't have mattered. It's a formality. So- even when people talk about the constitutional crap, look, I'm not a constitutional lawyer and I'm, I'm not a hundred percent certain. So don't attack me on this, but I'm virtually certain that even if Pence had tried to do the dumbass things that uh, Trump had wanted him to do, that none of that would matter. This actually returns to my previous point that stuff really matters whenever it comes to the States because Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano, people don't know this. The secretary of state of Pennsylvania is actually appointed by the governor, right? So if Mastriano, who's already pledged to do an alternative slate of electors based on whatever his vision of fraud is, okay, and, and okay, this is a funny thing. This also again presumes that Biden wins Pennsylvania in 2024 within the realm of possibility, but uh, not looking so good right now. So this requires basically the exact same situation to play out in 2024, where Mastriano would appoint different electors than have the secretary of state recognize those. I believe, I believe that that would then go to the Pennsylvania Supreme court and to the Supreme court of the United States. And look, even for all the right wing copium, I don't see a world where the Supreme court would allow that to stand. Maybe, I mean, look, maybe I'm wrong, maybe, but I, I just don't see that in any realm of possibility. So I actually do think, again, this is a state issue more than it is federal because i believe again that there actually isn't anything that congress can really do to block quote unquote the electoral results once the electoral college has been appointed by the states so you know let's just look we have a federalist system like I don't, you know that's another one that uh, always gets me here election law is state-based like people get to decide mail-in ballots all that other shit that's not determined by the feds i don't think it should be marshall you're from oregon People in, people in Oregon love mail in ballots. It was so weird. It was, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was really funny, even because uh, all my right wing friends were like, this mail in yeah. ballot stuff is crazy. Oregon has had mail in ballots Dude, since I, the yeah. 1990s. Now, that said, I'll, uh, <laughs> I've met some like very uh, right wing Oregon Republicans who think that like that's why Republicans don't win the state anymore. So, like, I always kind of had the conspiracy theory argument. Like, it's just obviously like not true. Is that even true. Yeah. I was just, no, I it's, 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 right. There's a theme of there being a lot of cope in our political system. Um, yeah. You know, like, the, 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 but yeah, I, I, to, to, to your point. So, I, I think that the thing I want to sum this up with, um, because there's this funny dynamic here where people see us as these like, we're these guys who are like pushing from the outside and we want like outsiderism. We think the system doesn't work, but so much of our political analysis boils down to this is why things aren't going to change. It's a weird contradiction. It's actually true, right? Because we have, what's funny is people see media, Sagar and Marshall breaking points, the realignment, all those things. They didn't see us when we were like working at think tanks 
or going mm-hmm. to college, interning in Congress, like studying in the system. And something that you and I, I think is unique in terms of our actual position in this like independent media sphere is that we very much came from this like establishment, like analytical background. So I'm just not the type of person who's just able to wake up and go like, oh yeah, like we're just going to like make things change. It's going to be all good to go. Um, when I'm like, no, I'm always going to come back to this idea of like, actually, here's this limit. And that's what you were just saying. With like yeah, the, let me expand on this because Crystal was talking about this earlier. She was like, I think it would be good for the country if somebody could do something on guns. And I was like, I was like, no, like the whole point is that nothing can happen because we have zero trust society. And I think people should realize that. Like, I think people should actually understand that people, that it's nothing is going to happen, not because of the NRA, not because of COPE. But because uh, millions of people, enough that in their congressional representation, don't want shit to happen in, as a result of the Uvalde shootings. And you should ask, you're like, how did that happen? Why exactly? I mean, it's a lot of structural reasons. I'm taking this individually away from anything to do with uh, the actual situation in Uvalde and extrapolating it to like gun politics, which have honestly, it's fascinating how libertarian and right-wing gun politics have trended in the last several years. And I just don't think, I don't think a lot of, I think people need to actually grapple. Like, why is the political system broken? Can I have one copy to what you just said? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Because I want to be very precise, right? So Crystal is talking about at, at at the federal level. But yeah. even even in Parkland, like the, the the Florida legislature, right, like a very like Republican legislature, like they passed red flag laws. Yeah, so so that's so, right. so so and this goes to the point that and actually that's federalism to like where you started with. So once again, I don't want people to confuse not to sound condescending, but I don't want people to confuse our like structural analysis with like maybe the moral height of some issue. Like Sagar, like you don't like our China policy. You don't like our supply chain mm-hmm. policy. You don't like your energy mm-hmm. policy. Like the way you articulate these things, these are like the height of the issues at the, at the top of American politics. But that is separate from thinking, oh yeah, like I understand why the port of LA in many respects is a weird mix of state, federal, and local policies. And improving that system requires understanding the intersection of all three. And I think that is something that independent media folks do just not deliver enough of. There's like way too much of like, we looked at the, look, we, we always get in this fight with Kyle and Crystal. We looked at this poll and this poll said everyone wants X. And the fact that X isn't happening means that things are corrupt. What I'm saying is it almost always, especially in issues like guns, once you actually look into those parts, it, it, it gets, it gets way more, um, complicated. But that's, that's my, that's my, like, oh, let me just give my last big thought on the January 6th thing. Cause I think this is the most important takeaway. And I frankly think this is the only conclusion that a Democrat or an anti-Trump Republican could take from it. Look, everyone has a binary opinion on January 6th. Either January 6th was a confusing, nothing burger where Trump was like slightly silly and immature. You had like all these like mistakes made like on the ground at a non-political level by the Capitol police and like a bunch of silly Republicans. And it means nothing. It shouldn't lead to impeachment. It doesn't say anything about Trump. And it's just an example of the mainstream media not being fair. Like if they'd covered the, um, you know, BLM rights in the summer of 2020, the same way, that'd be a different conversation. That's one perspective. The other perspective is, Holy crap. This is one of the worst acts in like modern presidential history. Um, we didn't impeach Trump, but like whenever Trump announces again for 2024, like you should vote against him because no one wants to go over that again. Those are the two positions. And I think right now, if you are, if you are a Democrat, you should be channeling your energy there, which is it's a binary issue. Like that's what it comes down to. Like 2024 isn't going to be an election about like the exact price of gas. Well, I think this would be different if Ron DeSantis oh, were the nominee, but if, Trump, <laughs> yeah. but if, but if, but I think just given Trump, given the nature yeah. of Trump, an election with Trump is going to be maybe a, let me put it this way. There's a generic Republican nominee against Joe Biden. And then there's Trump. An election with Trump versus Biden is going to be much closer to was Trump the worst president in the modern era or can we go back to the way things were in 2019 and pretend 2020 through 2021 didn't happen? That's the binary choice. And I think what Democrats should be doing, to your point, is focusing energy there. Um, and and, and that, that's just like the underlying fact. And anything beyond that is just like kind of superfluous and very muddling and just like you're not going to get the Watergate out of it. Yeah, it's just a bunch of bullshit. I mean, look, I, I'm just, it makes me so angry. It's it's their fault that Trump even has a f- chance to win the presidency again. 
It's like, that's how cringe and terrible you are. Biden just hit the lowest approval rating ever for a modern president. Lower than Trump, too, by the way. That actually takes skill. With an actually worse, he has a 56% disapproval rating, which again is almost actually, I think, higher than where Trump was at, even in some of the lowest types of his presidency. They're not even going to have to worry about January 6th because they're about to get their asses kicked in the election. So look, I, I just have a lot. I, I believe... Uh, you know, it's funny. I talk about this sometimes with Republicans. They're like, uh, the, uh, the election was rigged because uh, the media was unfair. It's like, shut the fuck up. The media is always unfair. Just win. It, 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 there, Yes. Are there structural problems against you? Yeah. No shit. There has been against every modern outsider candidate ever in the history of American politics. You fight within the system that you've got. And a lot of the times you actually do win if you play smart and you play the political tides the right way. So Bitching and moaning and this process, I just think it's ridiculous. I, I really, I just think that all, all of it is cope for not doing well in, in politics. And people see through it. That's the one good thing. I know that people see through it. Uh, it's funny. NBC did a, like a, NBC's Today Show did like a drive up thing in California asking people about gas. Every single one of them blamed the administration. These are Democrats, by the way. They're mm. like, they're like, yeah, look, I'm really struggling, you know, all this. I would love if they had asked them, like, oh, are you going to tune into the Jan 6 committee tonight? Like, who gives a shit? I'm sorry. There's been this, I've noticed this with uh, the January 6 hearings and yeah. gun policy. There's been this, and I'm just kind of like, I, I don't quite know what's happening here, but there's been this really weird inability especially amongst younger Democrats, so people our age, to separate mm -hmm. like your individual morality take from just politics, right? Like the the, the act of politics yeah, as I like hate being Trump. a That's different a form. <laughs> like, we, we, like, we, like, let's just say like this, this podcast is not a pro-Trump podcast, despite people wish casting it into one. It's too insane every once in a while. Uh, I'm not going to name who this person was. Someone sent me a like a, a very like right-wing uh, yeah. like email asking me to sign. I'm like, have you, they, they, they don't listen to the show. It's like the, 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 the obvious yeah. answer. Um, but no, so, I, so to your point, it's like, there's just this weird, and I don't know what, I don't know if this is like the infantilization of our politics or this is like weird social media stuff, but there's just this weird, like, Hey, like you guys realize that like David Hogg is probably the worst person you could ever cast to <laughs> leave. Like, what, what, do, do you mean, let's put aside the morality of the cause of like, of, of, of gun reform. Right. Yeah. Which, frankly, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to on a couple of different levels. Why would you craft David Hogg to be the guy? Right. Um, why is a like guy who literally tried to launch like a a weird like semi grifty like my pillow alternative that he had to drop out for a few months? Why is he the guy? It, it doesn't make any sense. It's like not. And you, you and I are always talking about like history and like LBJ and mm -hmm. JFK and FDR. You've got the Roosevelt thing in the background. The thing that I just keep taking and it becomes so clear to me as we get further and further away from that. And then also just read about them more and more is like, wow, like they just see this at a strategic level, but I just don't actually see. And I actually yeah. think it's kind of in a weird opposite position of like a lot of people see that strategy as like morally compromised and overly pragmatic and, oh, you're just like being too realistic or, oh, like, you know, I actually just think this is such a big issue. And so like, we had all these people who were like, you know, we, we got a lot of responses to the gun control talk last week. Mm. Uh, yeah, a bunch of people are like people, a bunch of people were like, and once again, like everyone said this nicely. So like, we love feedback, like keep it up. But a bunch of people's like take was like, yo, like, do you guys not see like how bad of an issue this was? Like, why are you saying nothing's going to fundamentally change? Like, that's like a like quasi I'm not immoral lie take. To you. As yeah, yeah, they're basically asking. This is actually this is the confusing part, right? There's this whole. We should do an episode on the civil rights era because it's like an interesting confusion in the civil rights era when there actually were the right number of votes for the civil rights act. There just had to be all this like arm twisting. There, there actually was like it was very 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 difficult to do, obviously. Um, but there was always work to do, but it was actually achievable. People who just were overly focused on, look, like America is a complicated country and, you know, we have our history, but the South is different than the North. And like, do you really want us to pass this legislation when Malcolm X is going out and he's kind of poor? Like in that case, very specifically, I could understand and buy the argument that that is an act of like stopping change. 
making that argument. But guys, that's when LBJ had a 60 plus Democratic majority after one of the biggest Democratic victories, probably well, actually the biggest victory yeah, in, in history. American history. Yeah. In no world, yeah. in no world does Joe Biden have that ability. Therefore, like we are not speaking into reality, political stagnation. We are just describing that. And honestly, like you should ask yourself, you should ask yourself, I think there, I think there are two ways that this goes. And I'm just going to, this is like a semi, this is semi hot takes. I don't want to like offend anyone, but if someone, no, I guess there's three reasons. Here's the best version. People are trying to push the Elberton window, um, of like book Sager, Marshall, like obviously we're not going to pass what we're going to pass, but like we are moving the Overton window on these issues in a way they haven't been done no, before. No, you're not. You're actually making it way worse. I'm just going to say that. I, I okay, honestly, so, so I, I think that's can, can, I, can I play that person? I want to hear you respond yeah. to that. I'll, I'll play that person because yeah, that's ahead. interesting. Sagar, I've worked in politics for decades. I know, especially in a you know mansion cinema Senate, we're not going to pass gun legislation. But what we are working to do right now is long term turn gun control into a litmus test issue for the Democratic Party. Yes, we have all these problems. There's inflation, all these like, things going on right now. But in 2028, 2032, we're going to make a difference there. We're just like gay marriage advocates who were saying, hey, like, let's do civil unions in the 1990s and then this, 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 and that. And then in 2015, things look way different. So I'm taking a long-term view where we push the Overton window and transform the way the party approaches this. Yeah, that would be a valid argument if gun control hadn't been on the national agenda for over 50 or 60 years. We literally know how this plays out. And actually, the only times that it's ever passed, ever had any public support in American history is when we had high levels of institutional trust. And actually, no, abortion is a perfect example. You know what, folks? You guys actually succeeded on that standard. And by doing that, you abandoned the most effective political slogan of all time called safe, legal, and rare, and effectively turned off moderates and a lot of other people from your side until the religious right is finally about to score its victory on overturning Roe versus Wade. Up until that, the right was unambiguously winning when it came to abortion politics because it was encompassed by Lena Dunham and all these other people who were like celebrating the fact that they got abortions. That's exactly what you're doing, quote unquote, moving the Overton window on guns. Saying the quiet parts out loud is actually a historic disaster. We are going to take your AR-15. We, Joe Biden came out for assault weapons ban, Kamala Harris. The de facto position of this administration is that the only viable solution is assault weapons ban and that they're compromising whenever it comes to a so-called red flag law or 18 to 21. 18 to 21, that other stuff, that's safe, legal, and rare type politics. By sticking to that, you're actually, you're on a semi-majoritarian footing. But because everybody knows what your wink, wink, secret agenda, not even secret, out of, uh, not actually, it's not even wink, your actual agenda is, is you are making gun people dig in harder than ever before. I was trying to explain this on breaking points because people, let me give you a good example. People talk about universal background check. Sounds great. Uh, what that would mean is that you need a background check in terms of private sales of guns. I don't even necessarily oppose that in spirit, but here's the issue. In order to enforce that, you need a universal registry of guns that the ATF has access to, which was the precursor in Australia and in other countries for buy, uh, buybacks and for eventual confiscation. So when you're telling us that you want to confiscate guns, but the compromise position is your universal background check registry system, guess what you're going to fight like hell to make sure never happens? Once again, this comes to trust. So I think that if you want to set a standard of, so for example, I think the destruction of the pro-life Democrat was a huge mistake for the Democratic Party. Um, nobody ever talks about, what's that guy's name? He's a governor. See, I don't even know his name. The governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, I think. Is yeah. that it? Uh, that guy's pro life he, he won re-election. He's a Democrat in Louisiana, a place where there used to, by the way, be Democratic senators from. You know, Bernie Sanders, to his credit, actually endorsed a pro-life Democrat, I believe in 2017, and explicitly said, he's like, look, I'm pro worker. People believe what they want to believe whenever it comes to abortion. But I believe in winning elections and endorsing candidates who are going to do the best for working people, even if I may disagree with them on abortion. That was a long. My congressman, who I grew up with, Chet Edwards, was a pro. I believe he was a pro life Democrat. He had one of the highest approval ratings in all of Congress. I'm from an R plus 23 
district. And by the way, Chet Edwards was a great congressman. He brought in all this money for VA hospitals and uh, Baylor and a and People loved him. And he only lost because of the Tea Party wave of 2010. And look, I just think that, you know, look look at what's happening right now with Henry Cuellar, right? Everyone's like, oh, we got to wipe out Henry Cuellar because he's, he's a Texas. He's a Texas, yeah, he's a Texas, Texas Democrat. Democrat. Uh, the pro- progressive's been trying to uh, knock him out. And Crystal always makes a, a fair point, which is that she's not against him because he's just pro-life or pro-gun or whatever. It's because he was the only Democrat to vote against the PRO Act. I, I mean, at least that's a legitimate reason. But the popular case against him, he's not a real Democrat. Well, guess what? South Texas right now, if Henry Cuellar isn't the nominee, a friggin' Republican is going to win that. And you know, something I've personally noticed is that- You sound like you're uh, defending Joe Manchin there, Sagar. Oh, I, I mean, listen, Joe Manchin is a great Congress, uh, is a great Senator and people can hate on me all they want for that. Uh, I think that he actually uses his ability to, uh, to tightrope walk cultural issues like abortion and guns specifically in order to cover up some of the things that he does, which I think are abhorrent and horrific, like the corruption of his daughter, like the ignoring of uh, black lung coal miners, and, and so many areas where I can blatantly see his corruption. And, and that's the point, is that stuff gets lost because of his literal ability to tightrope, uh, to have non, uh, non-traditional views on cultural issues. It's like, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills sometimes. If people think that moving the Overton window on guns to a position where is far outstream of both the American tradition, the American voter, and just generally of the moment, I think it's one of the dumbest things you could possibly do to try and win elections. It's interesting because what I liked about your articulation there is that I, I do think the Overton window expanding, and to give, give a quick definition of people who haven't heard the idea before, it's basically this idea of like, there's a, there's a set like space that you could typically engage in a policy on. So like, for example, let me give, what's a good example of this? Uh, the Overton window, what's what's a good Overton window? Oh, like in, like in America, um, the Overton window for taxes is basically like the current tax policy we have, yeah. post-Trump, ta- post-Trump tax cuts, and like some moderately higher Bill Clinton tax rate. So the 1990s versus 2017, those are like the, those are the, the extents. Overton window shifting would be like, hey, I'm Bernie Sanders. I'm yeah. going to talk about how in the 1950s, we had a 90% tax rate and the country was in a better place. And if we had a 90% tax rate now, like you'd have less inequality and you would have more social programs, all these different things. Like Bernie Sanders doesn't think that he's going to get a 90% tax rate. What he's trying to do is expand the window of discourse or even conception on the issue so that when you actually have the debate, it's like, okay. We're not going to argue in favor of like the weird 1950s when half the world is destroyed after World War II, but we're going to say like, hey, like, what if we had a 50% tax rate? If we had a 55% tax rate? What if we don't just treat taxes as these bad things, we treat them as something which could actually be beneficial and produce for the common good? That's an example of, of the expansion here. So what I like about your articulation here, which I've actually never heard before, so like serious, mm-hmm. serious, like we're, we're discourse swimmers, so it's like props, but I've never heard something like that before, is you're making the point that actually in this case specifically, the actual expansion of the Overton window actually undermines the actual case for the more medium term thing you it's actually like can maybe want to the accomplish. There you go. That's oh, that, great that, example. That's example I was just, I'll, I'll pick that up because to your point, um, defund the police is such a toxic frame that you could say, we weren't actually going to defund. Like, this is what they say. We weren't actually literally going to zero it out. Yeah, but you but said- But you're like, but wait, <laughs> like, like you just associated every single reasonable policy. Like for example, we could have a debate and we, I don't know anything about the topic, right? But we should have a debate around, hey, like should a mental health person like mm-hmm. intervene or should it be like a police who's armed to the teeth? Like what does militarization look like? Choke codes, all those different bits. But all of those policies are now encompassed under defund the police can all be handled in a bad faith way. So that, that's a good pivot to uh, the San Francisco DA's race, but I'd love for you to give any closing thoughts on this topic. Yeah, let's take it in San Francisco. It's a perfect example. You know, if you believe in, uh, it's just so funny to me that uh, the progressive DA, like even if you believe in some progressive, you know, criminal justice reform type policies, expanding the Overton window to include defund the police is the worst possible political move 
you people ever could have made. It's interesting. I've been watching the criminal justice reform people react kind of in real time and shout out. I think there's a political uh, science professor. I think he's at Oregon State University. He's like a big criminal justice advocate. And he just pointed out, he's like, look, you know, the, the sloppy and bad implementation and the political backlash is ruining like my life's work. Whenever it comes we, to pause real quick? Uh, criminal justice reform. Yeah, go ahead. Could you say what I, I didn't set this up right. Could you say what happened in San Francisco this week? Oh yeah. Okay. So Chase Boudin, the district attorney for, uh, San Francisco was recalled 62% of the vote in terms of people who showed up a, a pretty high turnout, actually tens of thousands of votes cast. Uh, he was tossed out because of the perception that he did not care a lot about crime and that he was not prosecuting crimes uh, to a fulsome extent and not doing anything to try and bring down the murder rate. So his defenders would say, well, actually, Chesa prosecuted more crime, brought more charges than any other DA before him. It's just that he used diversionary tactics. The critics would point out, I think rightfully, that he intentionally did not prosecute some cases in order, in some cases, to protect illegal immigrants, in others, uh, letting you know convicted murderers and others out on the street. But, you know, I've really been thinking about this because people are overreaching on their analysis I have no confidence that the LADA is going to get recalled in the same way that uh, Chase Boudin is. It's possible, but I have no confidence on that. And people also forget that that guy, Larry Krasner, who has very similar policy in Philly, which are also a disaster in my opinion, he won uh, a, a challenge actually from a more lock em up type DA. I think honestly that the reason Chase lost is because he's a terrible politician. And I mean that in that he would have these hilarious moments where he was visibly uncomfortable. Uh, hilarious, I mean, as in how terrible he was just publicly, where he just could not project the fact that he just didn't, he could not project a persona where he gave a shit about crime whatsoever. He would drop charges against people who had been murdered. He would you know, intentionally say that he wasn't prosecuting drug dealers because he didn't want illegal immigrants to get deported. Like He was not just able to voice a any concern, which was his job, in order to try and keep people safe in the city of San Francisco. So I've been thinking about it a lot because as I'm really glad that he's gone. I despise most of the policies that he put into place, but I honestly just think he was so bad at this and so awful in his, not just implementation, but in his public ability to voice this because people keep pointing to, you know, London Breed, who's the San Francisco mayor is like a huge liberal. <laughs> like she's going to be the person who appoints his successor she is woke, you know, also by almost every metric, but she just is a better politician by being able no, to she's say- No, she's not, she's, she, wait, she's not as, she's not as woke as he is. Like she actually, so, okay. didn't she, like, she, she, she supported um, the recall of all of the school board members. No, no, that's so my, why- My, my point is, it's get complicated. Into. So rhetorically, she's not, but she was supporting all this stuff just a year ago. She just uh, changed whenever the- winds of political change came and she was like, oh no, now I'm going to want to clean up San Francisco. I want, you know, let's recall these board mayors. That's, that's what I'm saying is that she's just more of a ideological shapeshifter. I don't have any real confidence. Wait, but you're going to be, yeah, wait, go you're just, just, but you're describing, you're just, this is the point, like <laughs> yeah. to our earlier concept of strategy. That's what, that's what politics is, right? No, like, I agree. They, I'm, they, I'm they, actually they, praising they, her. I'm, I'm like, they, you know, she effectively has a similar Policies. But you're saying this pessimistically. Yeah. My point is, oh, like, yeah, my, yeah, my, my, yeah, my point sure. is like, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm like, wait, that isn't yeah. pessimistic. That is actually, because look, guys, like, let's get real. Like, politicians like Bernie Sanders, um, you know, even like Ronald Reagan, who have like very like specific, discernible like ideologies. There's a philosophy. Like, that's not the norm. Like, most, like, think mm -hmm. about this, right? Like, look at most center left Democratic politicians their rhetoric on basically any issue you can imagine outside of let's say probably abortion is different than it was 10 years ago. The way Kamala Harris talks about crime is different than it yeah. was 10 years ago. That's because politicians are people who, especially successful national politicians, like yes, Kamala's poll numbers are not great, but like she was elected and that means that she's successful, you know, at a, at a, at a top end level of doing her job. They, they respond to moments. And I think what this moment is going to cause, and I think this is why there's a bit of optimism for folks is this is a moment which is going to force politicians to actually 
do their job, which is, wait, like, where does the country actually stand on all these issues? Because what you had happen essentially during, you know, early COVID onwards was you had a whole set of politicians like abrogate their actual duty, which is what do people actually think? What are the limits? What is the national vibe? I'm just saying, okay, because I saw a big Time Magazine piece or because some activists showed up at my door, I need to entirely like pivot hardcore on criminal justice reform, race and identity politics. You're seeing this in the Latinx fight. Um, yeah. You know, like you, you covered this with AOC this week. That's like an issue of like, no, like, why aren't you guys like in sync with your voters on this? Like, and, 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 here, and here's the thing too. It's, I entirely under, like, once again, like, I, I understand why someone, I genuinely do, like, in good faith, like, why someone could say, oh, like, I know my voters think this, but I think the opposite. But I actually don't think, like, that's the conception that's happening here. Like, I don't think enough politicians, especially, and this is more of a Democratic Party problem, the Republican Party has its own problems right now, but, like, we're talking about cities where Democrats are in charge and there are actual governance questions. Like, they aren't actually asking, like, hey, like, I know there are all these people and all these blue checks and all this like Twitter energy going one very specific direction. But like, is that true? Yeah. I think that part of their brains was turned off for two By years. Trump. By Trump. Yeah. And you know what's funny? And this is where like, once again, guys, it's that time in the episode, Marshall is going to Joe Biden shell. You know who didn't yeah. have his part of the brain turned off? Joe Biden during 2020. Joe Biden's response to everything we're discussing in 2020 the socialism, the defund was him being like, no, no, I know what I'm thinking. I know what I'm thinking. It's kind of funny because this is usually treated as a disparaging thing, but he, you know, licks his finger, puts it up in the air. He's like, yeah, we, we're not moving towards a reimagining of American politics on the li- issue of crime. Um, what you had was a bunch of folks, like, I, th- I, th- I, th- I texted this to you like earlier, actually. I think what you had happen was you had a whole set of politicians and activists, like nonprofit employees, foundations, et cetera, people on Twitter who thought the the, the, the murder of George Floyd was like the second Selma um, in terms of the civil rights era, which was, which was, this is this moment that is going to fundamentally reshape the American political system. And in many ways, I think Joe Biden like leans into that, right? He picks a black, um, you know, he picks a black woman for the Supreme Court, he picks a black woman to be his vice president, but he doesn't say, wow, everything has been so realigned that we're going to go pro-defund. And people like Chesa didn't actually do half of their job as a politician. And the funny then the last thing I'll add here, because this is sort of what gets me going, is in Chesa's inability to be a good politician, he has severely hampered his cause because you're right that this isn't going to lead to the, you know, LADA getting recalled. I'm not even sure if we should even recall the LADA. But guess what? Like the leader- I think he might be d- up for recall. I'm not sure. But, but here's but, the thing. The leader, yeah. but this is the key metric. Dude, the guy who's leading um, mm-hmm. in the race for mayor in LA right now, there's a runoff, but he's in the lead. Yeah. He's super, I'm going against crime. So like you're seeing this total vibe shift oh, on Rick this Caruso. issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's like right. that's, the, like, yeah. that's the point where like- and I'm not going to name this person, but someone tweet, someone was, was texting us and they said like, oh, like, I think people are being way too optimistic about this changing the politics of this issue. You know, the thing that really matters is that people thought crime was okay. I'm like, look, man, you're not seeing the actual underlying politics here. There was a whole set of center left to left politicians whose entire existence was basically framed in mid 2010 sense where like the entire conversation about criminal justice reform is, Hey, the eighties and the early nineties were crazy. There was so much crime and we as a society overdid it. And as you just saw with Ferguson and all these like literal police killings, we've gone too far in one direction. Our job is to push things back in the opposite direction. A lot of that still, I actually still agree with pretty much everything I said in that story, but with people like Chesa, he took it way too far the other yeah, direction, exactly. which is for most people, it's like, wait, like, why did the officer keep his effing knee on George Floyd for like that long? Like, why were there chokeholds being used? Why are people walking around like it's Fallujah in 2004, but they're just in a minor- majority black, black, you know, place? That's politics. That's like, there's a, there's a conversation to be had there. A lot of the whole like, wait, why are we, you know, three strikes laws look one way in the late 80s when there's crack wars. 
they look different, right? Like, you know, when those same like 18 year old kids are now in their fifties and they've never even Mm -hmm. seen like, like, you know, seen their kids or anything like that. That's different than saying defund the police. And if you cannot tell the difference between those two things, then you should either be an activist or you should be an academic. You should not be an elected politician. I mean, even if you're an activist, I think you're a fucking idiot because, you know, here's a good example. <laughs> that, was the most, that was the most uh, soccer thing of all time. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, let's, let's be, look, you, you want to end cash bail. Okay, good. It actually happened in San Francisco and I read about what happened. Here's what happened. Judges just decided to give people no bail, period. You know why? Because they were afraid that if they gave people no bail, that one of them would walk out of the courthouse like that guy in Wakesha, Wakesha. Wait, 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 sorry, uh, can I clarify? You said- yeah. I think you said that wrong. You said if they decided to give them no bail, you meant if they decided to give them bail with no, with, oh, what yeah, was it? Yeah. So, if they decided clarify. to give them bail, okay, so Chase and Boudin eliminates cash bail, right? Great. He starts, stops asking. Why is cash bail bad? Cash bail. So the argument under is the, that- Under the it, argument. Well, because it leads to like usury and people end up in prison and they can't get out because they don't have access to cash. I, I genuinely do think that's unjust and it's really fucked up in the way that it all works. But the whole point is, let's talk about what the follow on effects may be. And guess what? The follow on effect was that judges decided to just not give a lot of people bail because they knew that if they did that because without eliminating cash bail, it would make it so that they could just walk out. And like in Wakesha, Wisconsin, a guy walks out, gets no bail, goes and kills like, I don't know some odd people in that parade. And there were a lot of people who are out on bail, who killed people or stole people or held up people in San Francisco. And now the tide is actually swinging back to bringing back cash bail. So my point is, is that by trying to fix the problem, you made it 10 times worse and are now guaranteeing a return to 80s crime. You know, here's the policies. Here's another one. I don't know if you saw this. Eric Adams right now has a 29% approval rating on crime. 29%. 29%. This was and a very you know pro Eric Adams podcast. Yeah. So this is an yeah, interesting listen, turn. I, I mean, yeah. But why do you think though? Because people said, Eric, you said you were going to clean shit up and you're not doing anything, which is guess, guess what that's going to lead to. The opportunity right now is for Bloomberg or somebody like that to run against him and bring back stop and frisk. And I'm, I'm literally telling you, I think things could get to the point where pro stop and frisk type politician could win a New York primary three or four years from now if the murder rate continues, if crime continues, and if general lawlessness continues. And you will see a full-blown return to broken windows. So did your advocacy work? That's the question you should be asking because I think that basically they have set the political condition for their absolute ruin. And and I I think we're gonna see that in San Francisco. I think we're gonna see that in Los Angeles, no matter what happens in this recall with Gascon. I absolutely think whoever that guy, the billionaire guy is Rick Caruso, I think is his name. I think that guy's gonna win. Uh, And all of them are going to push some heavy, heavy policies. Um, and, And you know, that's a massive failure. And it's because of bad implementation of your policy. I mean. I think a lot about this in the energy debate, which is these greenies, uh, you know, right now are willing to like, you know, get the Biden administration to basically outsource our entire ch- supply chain to China on solar panels, literally only because California and New York have green energy targets that they have to hit legislatively. So they don't really give a shit where that power comes from and are trying to move away from natural gas and from nuclear power. It's like, okay, cool. You just made your grid more vulnerable to price spikes with less capacity power. And you are now making sure the supply chain all exists in China. So why? And and it's, it's just hilarious because the American people, all they want is to pay less for gas. Like if, if Trump or any Republican was president right now, the drill baby drill position, I would, I predict would be 75, 80%. I don't even think that that's the right policy. I don't think we should rely on fossil fuels forever, but it just shows you that it's like ideological blinders on your policy. If you don't do it properly, it will be a massive failure. You know, this is a good, uh, I'll, I'll give a Republican example, which is that if you're a pro immigration restriction, Donald Trump and Stephen Miller are the worst thing that ever happened to that movement. They probably killed it for, I don't know, what, a generation? I'd be willing yeah. to argue. Um, and the reason why was because they did the travel ban and, you know, they 
basically made it politically unpalatable and nearly impossible for that to have a majoritarian position to pass in the Senate when it was the de facto position of American politics not even a decade ago. So my point is that by being extreme, by having bad implementation, by being a bad politician, you do unending damage to the political causes and policy choices that you actually care about. I think that we are moving right back into lock them up and we are going to have an 80s type renaissance all over again. We may not have three strike, you know, three strike rules or whatever that come back, but I mean, cash bail ain't going anywhere anytime soon. There is no sympathy for those types of policies right now. You know, uh, I want to close. We've got like eight minutes left, so I want to close uh, on this thing. I want to hear, I'll give my answer, then I want to hear yours. What do you even think about the existence of recalls? Because there's a bit of like discourse around this because like- in, Love it. See, it's my, my answer. Here's my answer. I am actually sympathetic in the hypothetical to the people who push back on recalls in the sense that like they're low turnout. They're kind of like unfair as a conception, especially like we're talking about very complicated issues. Like even- as the New York Times pointed out, like the, the actual mm-hmm. like murder rate in SF isn't actually like any higher than it was. No, no, no. So the it's murder like, so number is not higher. The murder rate went up thirty seven percent. So let's just like look. To, I don't want to whitewash it. Yeah, yeah. homicides so my, 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 up in San Francisco, but overall homicides are not as bad as Baltimore or other cities. So yeah. the point is, it's it's complicated, um, yeah. and it's not a great system. In the hypothetical, this is what people who hate recalls will say: it's not a great system to like basically force politicians to be up just like that during complicated moments. That's kind of the whole point of this episode. Stuff is very complicated. There's a reason why most states don't have recalls, but the reason why I'm pro-recall, and this is also the Oregonian speaking um, in me, is in a one-party state like California, where there just is not a functioning Republican Party, same thing is true in Oregon. And by the way, this mm-hmm. also applies to plenty of red states in the South. So I'm not, this isn't a like liberal problem or this is just like an actual problem. Recalls are literally the only form of electoral accountability that could shock the system. Uh, because think about it. If we had, a, if, if California had a functioning Republican Party in 2022, you would have a Republican mayor elected in the city. But think about what just happened, right? You know, you just had. If, if, as people talked about, only three school board members were actually up for like recall, as everyone agreed, if everyone could have been recalled, almost certainly everyone would have been recalled. Chase mm-hmm. just lost his election. Functioning Republican Party, there's a Republican mayor in 2023. That doesn't happen. Therefore, a recall is actually the only alternative because it gets around the fact that it's, it's the only thing that will hold a politician accountable in that system. Because like in Oregon, it's basically this weird scenario where because there's no actual functioning Republican Party, you become governor if you just like last long enough in like the secretary of state position or like the majority leader position. And it just goes like that. There's like no interrupt function. And a recall is actually an interrupt function. Like it's actually, it's fascinating. Kate Brown, like, Kate Brown's the you know outgoing governor of Oregon. Like her approval ratings are terrible. Uh, yeah. It's actually it's actually kind of fascinating. It makes like kind of no sense. But there's no check on that. There's there's actually no reason for her to actually do better because there's no way she's going to lose re-election. I know there's a Republican who's kind of doing well in the polls there, but like I, I highly doubt um, you know that's going to be a thing back in Oregon. So a recall situation is the only one where there could be public dissatisfaction if there's only one party state. Well, I'm curious what you think. I completely agree. I, you know, I've, I've become kind of a small D Democrat person. I, I, I love it. I love, I mean, look, it's not that easy to do a recall, by the way. I just looked it up. It says that you need 12% of the votes cast in a previous, that's tens of thousands of signatures that you have to gather. It's not that easy in order to trigger a recall. And by the way, most of the time the incumbent wins, as you saw during, Gavin I mean, look, I, I would argue that the recall is the best thing that ever happened to Gavin Newsom. It made people yeah, it, realize, it, right? I am I rebu- wrong? It, 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 you're right. He he was down. It rebuilt him. Yeah, he's got his vigor back. Gray Davis. I think he deserved to get his ass kicked out. Um, you know, I, that, that's 2002. That's who Arnold yeah. took over for. That's who Arnold took over. Uh, I th- Arnold was a great governor. I'm just gonna say it. Uh, my thing, like you said, they're one party. Look, look at my man Schellenberger. Look, you know, I'm a big fan. I like Mike Schellenberger. He didn't even advance to the. To the runoff against Gavin Newsom, there's no independent possibilities. Actually, I think it was the San Francisco Chronicle wrote that up. They were like, "Look, this just proves the final death of the idea that any independent could advance." It's a one-party state, period. Uh, and also, though, 
within the because everybody has to run as a Democrat. I mean, look, functionally, this guy, the billionaire guy running for the L.A. mayor, he's like functionally a Republican. He's a moderate. Right? He's a Charlie Baker is Republican. A, <laughs> OK, but whatever. But he's running no, as no, a Democrat. No, 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 I'm that's saying, not, that's, yeah. that, that's his that's his politics. Exactly. So I'm like, OK, fine, whatever. You know, it, it's more about within those systems, I think, especially in the, given the dynamics of the state, I, I'm 100 percent pro recall. I think we should have recalls everywhere. I think it'd be great. So uh last topic because it's our uh it's our it's our bugaboo. We're we're very publicly known as being the pro celebrities and politics folks. So this is a mm-hmm. and once again, like this is relating to Uvaldi, so like I'm not trying to make light of Uvaldi, but um, you know, like you and I are you and I are fans of uh Matthew McConaughey. Uh um, McConaughey. You know, he 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 just gave um, you know, his his address at, at the White House and like let's just put aside for a second. Um, the underlying like politics of what he's saying, because I'm sure plenty of audience members are going to disagree. Like, I think he was just the most effective messenger Democrats could have had on that issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually, I can't, I actually can't think of a single issue where there would be a Democratic politician be more articulate on. Um, especially Marshall, like, here's your perfect example: the president says we need an assault weapons ban, and said we need to ban nine millimeter a high caliber ammunition, which shows he knows nothing about guns. It's like, yeah, and it's like and just McConaughey to, just gave to, the most perfect Bill Clinton type speech on guns that I'd ever heard. I don't even agree with it. Go and ahead. I want to give my, cause yeah. I want to give my, cause people think this take is vapid, but I think I actually have like, I think you and I actually, we talk about this a lot. Like, mm-hmm. I, like and once again, Dr. Oz won his um, Senate primary. My actual theory of the case here is that different moments require different styles of politicians. So if it's the 1890s, like get me a fat man with a big beard. Like that's like right. that is the political like that is the political system. That is the type of person who you want. Give me television. Give me handsome JFK. Um, it's the like like 1990s and foreign policy isn't an issue. Okay, it doesn't matter that Bill Clinton literally doesn't give a shit about foreign policy. His job is to make us feel good during the like 1990s. Different moments, different presidencies. Because everything here isn't really about policy, the 2024 election is not going to come down to what your position on universal health care is. It's not going to come down to your position on what the national debt is or student loans. It's going to come down to a very like up or down question of like, do you think the country is going to go in a better direction um, if you know Trump is in charge or right. is a Trump-led America worse than whatever we're dissatisfied with in the status quo? Like, that is the central question. I think, and this isn't just like shutting up Matthew McConaughey, I actually think actors with proper support are well suited for that. Like, think of Lauren Boebert trying to go after Matthew McConaughey. It would look ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Think of like MGT. Like, it just, it just doesn't work. Traditional, tr- traditional politicians. Let me put it back. Should we talk about this? Last thing I'll let you go to close this out, but like, I just get excited about mm-hmm. this. Think about this strategically. Strategically, the issue right now is we live in a situation where you're buttoned up like Connor Lamb, nice haircut, nice striped rep tie politician basically is really hampered because the underlying thing that person could do, make deals, work the room, be everyone's friends, sit with the Republicans at the party at the, you know, at the lunch table to make us all get along to quote Ben Sass's reference. Th- those skill sets don't mean anything during this moment anymore. And I think what actually really matters at this moment is being able to articulate being able to articulate some sort of direction. So like, I, this isn't me saying, you know, Matthew needs to run for president. This isn't me saying like Dr. Oz is solving all the problems, but I actually do just think my theory here is this is our, you know, JFK debates Nixon moment where different skill sets to make political accomplishments are going to be necessary. Matthew McConaughey isn't going to pass gun legislation, but I sure as hell think he'd be a better articulator and like, frankly, like representation of the Democratic Party's cause than Pete Buttigieg would be. Um, or any of those did things. you hear his speech? It was great. He was like, we need family values. Then he went and he did a Fox News interview with Brett Baer. He was like, we need respect. He talked about growing up in Uvalde and using guns with a BB gun and have responsible gun owners. Dude, that is a Clinton-esque type speech. That's how exactly how you speak to a divided country. Once again, I don't even agree with those policies because I don't uh, trust the freaks that would implement them. But if I were Behind it, I would damn sure choose McConaughey. I'm glad you brought up my man Oz. I mean, I think Dr. Oz could be president. This is the term. I, I, give people give people the term Oz. Yeah. You, you say I'm Oz Pill. I've been I've been I the day he announced, I tweeted, quote, I'm Oz Pill. Uh, a lot of people made fun of me for it. A lot of people said I had no <laughs> idea what I was talking about. Uh look, the guy won barely, but you think he's gonna cruise to election. 
Dr. Oz is a magnetic television person. You know, people just need to realize this. We live in the age of mass media. You need people of the medium in order to be good politicians. He is of the medium, Dr. Oz. So is Matthew McConaughey. He's a compelling, magnetic figure. That's what makes him such a great actor. He speaks with legitimate sincerity, the cadence of his voice and his pauses. I mean, and I don't even think it's an act. That's what makes it so good. Trump, Trump wasn't acting. I mean, listen, I met Trump. He's the, he is who he is. Like he never, um, he's, he's not playing you is more what I'm saying. Who he is is actually what you see. Trump was the first president. Trump and Obama, in ways, were the first two presidents of the modern age. Uh, Biden is a throwback for a variety of reasons that will never see his like again. It's like that Shakespeare term, like, we shall not see his like again. We shall not see the likes of Joe Biden ever again to grace the Oval Office. The days Out of his of seven these, runs, this was the only yeah, time he actually met right. the moment. For a confluence of reasons, right? Uh, COVID, there's a million reasons why Joe Biden is president. It won't happen again. Uh, either Trump, even if Trump gets reelected again, whoever comes after Trump is going to be a legit star. This is actually why I have a. If you were to ask me, like buy sell, I would sell DeSantis and I would buy Oz. I I and think quick, that. Yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, sorry, no. Please finish your finish your thought. No, I I, I would buy. I mean, I think Doctor Oz is. I think he's such an incredible politician. You know, I've watched him on this election stop the steal stuff. He never he never goes. Full MAGA. Every time he's like, oh, we need stronger election laws, all this stuff. I watch him on the trans kids. You know, these are all very dicey issues. And he's like, listen, you know, as a doctor, I would advise against it. I think we need to uphold family values. But I also think that some decisions should be between doctors and patients. And I was like, you just, I was like, you just hit like the majoritarian position on this. You just did the, you know, even on for a person who had to win a Republican primary and secure the Donald Trump endorsement, I don't even agree with his stop the steal flirtation or bullshit, but- but I was like, man, that's a good answer. It's a lot better than I've seen. Look, you know, J.D. Vance, your friend, but the guy, you know, he he was he went much further than Dr. Oz did on the election. Blake Masters says straight up, quote, Trump won. Oz never said any of that, man. I mean, when I see those, the way that, that he navigates, and I do think it's because he was on fucking Oprah for two decades. It's like he knows what people what people need. And at the same time was able to win this primary. So anyway, look, I think McConaughey, Oz, all these people, those people are the future. Yeah, I, I got kicked out. That's a sign. Uh, we need to uh, cut this episode. Everyone, this has been really great. Once again, these episodes are driven by by your feedback and your subscription and everything. So definitely reach out to realignmentpod at gmo.com mm -hmm. or send us a Supercast subscription. We always appreciate it. Thank you for joining and we'll be back next week.